street art has been a powerful force, a vibrant medium in San Francisco, which is one of the epicenters on a global level of street art in a very particular way in terms of artist activism and now the combining with technology for instant global influence. And as the pandemics and politics collide, we have a very active political and aesthetic and social front and record. So the conversation that we're gonna have about it, I've divided into three silos, protective, provocative, and playful. The first one we'll look at in the context of the tradition of art making in San Francisco, which in a very particular way relates to the legacies of the artists who have been climbing the walls and changing the images. And this is a picture of, of one of the original um, muralistas who painted the maestra piece, the women's building. And it is an example of how an ordinary piece of architecture is transformed, just like the Sistine Chapel, into an altar. And there is a recent book published about it. I highly recommend it. And it's part of the extreme sacred part of San Francisco that has a mural tradition from early Diego Rivera influences. There are more Diego Rivera's in San Francisco than in any other city outside of Mexico City. And this is his very famous 1931 painting that is at the Art Institute, sadly. One of the things in our cultural landscape that is in jeopardy during the pandemic. And 1931, of course, is the heart of the depression and Rivera, who is pictured on the scaffold, is looking at the artist as the vision and construction like an engineer with a faith in industry and technology and people working together and very much influences how we see um, the city of San Francisco itself. And in the 1950s, artists at the teachers, the painters, at the Art Institute wanted to put a curtain over it because they considered it so old fashioned. And recently, of course, there's been a revival of appreciation for what Rivera accomplished. He is very much influenced, and this affects the way you can look at the city and look at muralism uh, affecting the very architecture and advertising and perception of the city uh, from a cubist and filmic point of view. This is a multi-narrative, everything happening at once. And you have monumental and intimate realities colliding. So hold some of those aesthetic principles in mind as we look around San Francisco. And my own um, observations, and we are all experts in this subject because we live here and we see it changing. And like a landscape, it's a constantly changing environment. I put this book together, which is now a decade old, and it chronicled the way in which um, a very special combination of with and without permission. By daylight, it with community building or stealth underground, and that whole range of art making, both the incentive and the style but from 10 years ago, we're working on a whole new generation of artists and how the city itself has changed in the last 10 years. And of course, San Francisco has reputations for bohemians and gold diggers and hippies and yuppies and techies and all those other labels that are hurled around the city and yield a, a kind of cultural uh, fusion, almost like the flavors of our mixed cuisines. Uh, but I want us to hold in mind the thought that opens the film, Last Black Man in San Francisco, when Jimmy Fails says, you don't get to hate it. 
unless you love it. So let's hold that attitude toward this town as we're looking at the way the city has changed while many people were sheltered in. And of course, this tradition isn't exclusive. It's been going on and on, and you can even see in the shape of this, carrying some of the fiercest, most direct, bold issues. This, of course, is about femicide and other um, ways in which there's an outpouring of creativity to express rage that we are familiar with. And the graphic messaging that competes with advertising and political cues and cliches that are hammered and reinvented comes out of an art making tradition that has a lot of visual power of messaging Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer, or some contemporary practitioners, but it's, it's, it's a very old form, especially when you're looking at the social commands. This particular piece is on Clarion Alley and has changed its message many times. I put this in as an example of a traditional contemporary mural that is on Clarion Alley uh, because it feels pertinent to the moment with our dreams on fire and as we shelter in and really don't know what we're facing. There are many virtuoso aspects of this painting. If you just look at the way the patterning itself is creating both a structure and a disorientation. Um, but we're gonna go into the primary, everything that you see from now on with a few exceptions that I'll point out has been created in the last few months, including this is the very first note on the first day when the orders to shelter in and this strange way in which the streets got quiet and there was a sense of, oh, everyone be okay as they moved. These kind of positive messages, graphic, optimistic, were found everywhere. Things like this showed an artfulness that goes back to traditions from Kathy Kulowitz and social realists. The very humble aesthetic of this is yet so poignant, you can practically hear her singing through her mask. We're not the only ones. This is a simultaneous, just the way the protests have broken out around the world, parallel, instantaneous. This is in Venice Beach, a few blocks from where my son lives. And this is the very first mural on the first day. I said, I've got to see what people are doing. And in a very safe way, try to be very safe, uh, respectful, um, I saw Tracy painting. This is Tracy Piper and the theme she took, of course, is inspired by the Rosie the Riveter and the Ken Do spirit that we face things. And I happen to love her little cloud overalls. I didn't, this is late in the afternoon and very shadowed. I went back determined the next morning to get a clean picture, but it was already beginning to be tagged. And the next day it had a Salvador Dali mustache on it. Um, so even something as accomplished as this is part of the ongoing conversations. Many of you may recognize the way in which the saints and the protectors who've become icons for San Francisco. And this is a uh, honoring of Brownie Mary, who was the, um, person with the marijuana brownies uh, who brought comfort and care during the AIDS epidemic. And she is um, the subject of a recent book by her daughter. Uh, and these are also the famous twins who walked around downtown, giving you a little stay home, stay safe message. Uh, same technique, same artist, where there are um, paper uh, drawings that are cut up and pasted. Very popular technique. It's the one that Banksy sometimes uses and uh, Swoon and other uh, street artists in terms of the strategy. This is a very 
um, almost romantic rescue of the, the damsel in distress, heroic, uh, on the side of Laszlo adjacent to foreign cinema. And this is an honoring of all the people who were not sheltered at home because they were bringing us essential services. We saw this message everywhere. This is an example of the field workers coming from a long tradition of the um, Chicano, Latino, UFW, striking, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, they're all over San Francisco for decades, 50, 60 years of honoring this tradition and their work goes on. This was painted on Valencia Street by Mel Waters, who is one of the most accomplished street artists. You've seen his Cesar Chavez, his very beautiful piece in Chinatown. His brushwork, his just stroke of light and expression and gesture is very accomplished and moving. And we have a full range of skill and style and intention in the work that's shown. And of course, we have to honor the healthcare workers. And I have to take a moment to honor my own daughter, Dr. Jada Larson, who is an emergency room doctor in Tucson. And every day at seven o'clock when we ring, we bang loudly all the way to Tucson. And this is in Glen Park. As I scouted around the city, it was very interesting to see where there were clusters of messages and the nature of them. This is a, uh, I believe a skincare parlor and very, you know, th there's just radiant goodwill. This is an, a message that was floating around the internet that suggested all the things we could do with this pause, all the things that might be better. We all recognized that the air was cleaner and that it was actually great not to be buzzing around. Obviously, there were several people who weren't that lucky to just notice the meditative calm, but this spirit gave a pause for contemplation. And it's early, she put this up early, you know, come back stronger than before. Our love will see us through. There's a way in which every, you know, spiritual uh, icon you found all over town um, in tender and reverent ways, shamans from different traditions, a kind of upbeat, you know, protect ourselves. Uh, look at, um, you know, what's kept us strong and bold in the past, and even wistful for another time. There's a sense of spring in this very tender portrait, almost like everyone has allergies. Notice her beautiful butterfly earrings, all drawn with an idea of being in touch with the natural world. And a message of caring, compassion. This is in Dog Patch from uh, the uh, Rickshaw Backpack Factory. So it came from individuals, it came from businesses, it came from artists, it was all over. The very first time I noticed, the very second day I went out, plain pieces of plywood boarding things up, an alarm went through me at first because it reminded me of like, you know, the riots in 92 and, and broken glass. But these became more ways of expressing hope. Something good is inside, something is in store, we'll be back, more like gone fishing, take care. This is, you know, a classic protection uh, against the evil eye. This is Fatima that we see in Middle Eastern traditions translated into all kinds of talismans we can uh, apply. And of course, we change social habits and we got more time to see people who weren't lucky to be sheltered in. And wash your hands and be safe wasn't applicable to all. And you got to see them more because these people are waiting online in their little six feet apart circles, 
to get their groceries. And this is in the Castro, a club we used to dance and we love. We will rise and dance again together again. But of course, we can't resist the pathos of the contradiction of the woman living in front of them or the man sleeping in front of the Smokey the Bear. There are a lot of bears all over town. Obviously, there are bear traditions in California in a specific way um, and the goodwill of a bear, but you'll see some others as it's changed. On the right, we have an example of another message that you will see repeated through it that must be done by the same artist because it changes and sometimes they're in Spanish, but it's definitely like a super graphic and just these little quizzical things that change their meaning where you see them. You can look at all these slides as if we're either on a travel log or in a film with clipping around the same city in some time-lapse motion. This is a cheat because this is actually in New York City and it was actually pre-pandemic. But the reason I picked it is because this desire has been with us for a long time and it seemed appropriate to a whole theme of back to nature that nature ultimately will dominate and has the upper hand when the swans are returning to the canals and the air is remarkably cleaner and all of those other ways in which this reference to the Renaissance is something we can both see and contribute to and decide that's our direction during this time. So this is a, you know, offering of vitality and paint the void, as you see by the hashtag, it became a phenomena in, in terms of both color and flourishing, blooming imagery. This particular piece, which is, you know, radiant, was featured in the New York Times article about the fact that San Francisco was, you know, abundant with this kind of make it beautiful, you know, like under construction, gone fishing feeling. And with the messages of almost like the fairy tales of making a better world while we take a nap. And the snowy hibernation, little bears making, can you see both sides? Yeah, little bears making masks and the mothers wearing masks and the kind of adorableness of everybody wearing a mask is contrasted with the fact that the coyotes have been roaming up and down Valencia Street and this is another technique that I found very commonly used. It's created very quickly on your computer and printed out cheaply and pasted up uh, again on a sense of what might be here and howling in a classical coyote way up to be able to hear the way we normally can't in a city, to be able to see and breathe in fresher ways. Uh, this is the famous Hay Street Grill, kind of just encouraging us all to keep afloat. Uh, very elaborately realized fish in Hayes Valley by Max Ehrman, who is, you will see his work all over town. He's very prolific. He has a very accomplished spray technique as you can see with lovely airbrush nuance creating all those transparencies. A very different kind of art style referenced in this that more like a kind of neo Rousseauian faux primitivism, very stylized, you know, beautiful lotuses. But really the depth that's created by that cloudy abyss creates the mystery of this piece that felt very akin to the mood we were all experiencing in isolation. A kind of very um, dramatic egret out of scale, reclaiming 
public space, all the concrete and scaffolding, cold metals around, and a very tender and beautifully realized piece of art that draws from classical Asian brushwork with a very airy and mystified uh, sense of rediscovery and contemplation. This is downtown at a bar that's obviously shuttered up uh, for a while, a piece by a mandolin who uh, has work all over town. Her other name is Mags in terms of her street work and she now walks all over the world. Many of these artists do who began in the street. Uh, and she often has enchantments. She has a big piece in mission that says you are magical or fairy tale like um, ways in which we all should go into our imagination. Again, very just lovely pastoral, good nature flowers and very beautiful dragonflies that are ephemeral that were literally sprayed a few hours after they were made like their short lifespans. And a big old field of happy flowers at Amato's serving cocktails. None of us can wait till they start playing classical music again. This is an example of a very unusual floral treatment and from a neighborhood that didn't have a lot and the nexus right across from Laguna Hospital. And it wasn't until Sarah, who's recently lived in China, looked at it twice and realized they're not flowers. It's the ingredients for hot pot. That's bok choy and thin sliced meat rolled into flowers. So everyone has both their sense of what's inside when we return in our offerings. And Buffalo Exchange, playing on its name, commissioned this beautifully elaborate, almost Joan Didion could have written this about what it means to have an imagination and travel to the West. We see the car there, which situates all of us in this great landscape. And you can see that there's a lot of um, attention to the artistry, the sacred circle in the center, and the even the almost Maxfield Parish-like florid um, detail colors in the sky. Um, takes us to a time before it was all concrete. This is a heart that is made of lots of dancing leaves and hearts, of course, represent in somewhat sentimental way San Francisco. And this also represents San Francisco in a silhouette that's become very familiar, the towers and downtown um, landmarks we can all recognize. This is a piece by uh, Amos Goldbaum, who's famous for felt the tip drawings that he um, blows up, recognizing a sense of place. So the next ones are all going to show what happens as almost Trump lie for what's behind the door. The piece on the left is another graphic that's just been printed out quickly on a piece of vinyl, actually shows a portrait of the building it's on with beautifully rendered plywood covering the uh, windows. The door in the middle speaks for itself like the door to wear behind it. And the taqueria, we've probably all seen that taqueria on the corner of 18th Street. It will reopen, that is our faith. This is a piece of art probably commissioned on the side of foreign cinema, a very lovely posh restaurant in the mission. And it is in the league of like Ed Bruchet and the kind of making very stylized California art out of very ordinary things in a very graphic way, gas stations and things like that, that he um, was one of the champions of. And this of course, 
is a portrait of the 99 cent store right down the street from foreign cinema, an example of the juxtaposition of uh, privilege and um, economy, I'll just say, uh, side by side. This is the bar, Laszlo, adjacent to foreign cinema on Mission Street with the portrait on the left of the gallant gentleman rescuing the lady, and then an equally nostalgic piece on the right of a different mood, which is looking at the boat taking off. You can read your own, there may be other interpretations, obviously these are wistful art pieces that are relatively deliberate and accomplished and they haven't been tagged which I find kind of interesting. Another one that has remained pristine, even as um, the mood changes later in these, um, reminding you of the kind of silhouettes, is it the lady or the lamb, and other mysteries that I have not fully decoded myself, and I'm sure there are interpretations. This is on 16th Street. Another playful, happy geometric on the pizzeria on Valencia. And an example of one of the many, 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 I could show you dozens of very fully realized graph pieces on fresh plywood. A gentle reminder that this is all brand new. The piece on the right is inspired by graph and shows you the evolution, sophistication and art, self-consciousness almost of graph done by a mission artist named Ricardo Ricky, who is on the street known as Apex or Apexer. He grew up in the mission. He is black, which made him an outsider in most of the early spray and gangs and now he is one of the, the the senior and he travels all over the world having taken the original forms into a sculptural um, form as you see on the right that's as sophisticated as any mid-century color field paintings. I wants to invite you to this cafe as soon as it opens again, because this is painted very lovingly as an example of the good times we like to have and hope for again in this lovely monochrome blue on the side of Francis Cafe and 17th Street. This is another side of the same tableau. And it is a takeoff, a send up, a, a play on the famous 1945, the war is over and everyone's kissing each other in the streets that, you know, like Rosie and the River during the beginning. But it took someone pointing it out to me that this is actually two men kissing. So I was very slow and see if you notice that in a celebratory way. And this is a message that I believe many businesses were giving out to all of their beloved traditional patrons. Um, I think, are we at the end of our first session? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, I'm gonna actually put, leave it there and let you take over because I just showed you a lot and it's just as important to hear what everyone has to say as what I have to say. So. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes to hear these observations and then we already have a sneak preview. The next section is provocative, but these were protected. Anise, do you want to stop screen sharing so that we can see everyone in the class? Sure. What should I touch? Stop sharing. Um, I did. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. And then I don't know if you want to make yourself visible to the class as sure. well. Sure. Why not? Um, for everybody here, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, um, you can raise your hand using the raise hand feature. And you do that by clicking 
on participants at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then it will pop up on the top right and there should be a little blue hand on the bottom left. Oh, great. Jolene, do you have a question? And I think you're unmuted so you can go ahead and ask it. Okay. Um, you know the one where you thought it was the man caressing the woman? That's actually part of the cover for a famous film that um, won the Oscar for Best Foreign Film. It's called Black Orpheus, and it's patterned at, it's a Brazilian take after the Greek mythology of um, Eurydice, and um, you know the, and, um, there's Hermes in it, and it's actually patterned after a Greek myth. You know, I would love to have heard what you said. It was completely um, all static. Can someone repeat it? Or make yes, so Jolene had commented that um, the image of the man rescuing the damsel in distress, that that is the exact visualization of the famous movie called Black Orpheus, oh, which won well, an Oscar in 1960. Well, we love that? Orpheus. That's a famous myth, of course. But thank you for putting that together because we can extrapolate so many correspondence to Hades and 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 to being in jeopardy and to don't look back and all of the rescue and and the most beautiful music in the world in that movie. So and yes, it, thank you. That movie actually started the Bossa Nova crisis in the U United States. Yeah. Okay, I think um, Dennis has a question. If you'd like I had to a comment yourself. to make. Uh, the uh, the the picture you showed of the uh, the boat is basically based on I think a story from South America that was made into a, a movie. Oh, Fitzgerald. Yeah, that's what I think it is. That because the guys were in white, and the boat looks like it's being lifted over land from a body of water, possibly to another body, or it's coming to that body. I'm not sure. Well, that's a brilliant that's correspondent because if you don't know that story, it's it's a Werner Herzog movie. Um, it's it, it's a very intense, uh, like an impossible task. Uh, is the actor who just died the star of it? Anyway, uh, it, do you, does anyone else think that that is what that refers to? Because it's it, it's fascinating if it is. We have two movie correspondents that would be Black Orpheus and Fitzcarraldo. And foreign cinema would likely choose two movies. So that makes sense. Great. Um, I'm going to ask some of the questions that were posed in the chat. Um, Delene had said, did these establishments consign these murals or just tell the artist it's okay? Or did folks just take the initiative? All three, some were commissioned, paid for, like the, the Buffalo Exchange one, I am certain was commissioned and paid for. The artist who made that did the Frida Kahlo, uh, that's a very elaborate and that same, they, they, they're a well-known group uh, who do major complicated um, commission pieces. The, um, I, I'm gonna say that the ones on foreign cinema, I'm about half of them, if it has a hashtag that says paint the void, that was a program very deliberately set up as a way to create revenue for the artists that businesses participated in. And then they got to work with the artists and pick what they wanted, you know, in some way. Then of course, their volunteer, just it's boarded up, I can put something here. And then, you know, there's a lot of stealth, uh, all of it. Great. Great question, though. And similarly, she had asked, why are some tagged and some not? But maybe you- I don't know that. if I can answer that one. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I could speculate along with the rest of us. Um, there's been years of uh, tension between, you know, formal uh, artwork put up with high intention and the sort of scruffy, you know, I don't respect this. It's a form of conversation. Uh, but at the same time, occasionally, some are just not touched. Artists have learned to self-protect who do very elaborate murals that, you know, are very, you know, they want them to last because there's a new material 
that they can scrub spray paint off of. So it gets like a clear coat vinyl that even if it's tagged, they, get, they have a, a solvent to remove it. But none of these seem to have gotten that treatment. Okay. Um, I see Jackie Proctor is unmuted. I don't know if you had a question. I'm unmuted. I mean, I'm, yes, no, I didn't. Um, I just wanted to, if I wanted to say something, but nothing in particular. <laughs> oh, okay, no problem. I thought it was okay to do that. <laughs> um, if anybody's having trouble raising their hand using that like virtual feature, you can raise your hand on the screen with your actual hand and I can try to look through and see if anybody has their hand raised. But if not, we can just move on, but I'll give it well, a Let me ask a question a while minutes. I have everyone. Sure. Are you able to see them well enough? Because I know that a lot of them are dense and all of this is being recorded meaning that if you ever want to look at them again, not so fast, because I'm, it's like I'm taking you on a very hustly uh, instant tour um, that you would never be able to speed around in helicopter and see them this fast. So is this pace reasonable? And for the ones you want to go back, like and read or just see, see them again, some of them are interesting, you will be able to. So what's the, what's the general sense? Is it, yeah, we can see them, and um, and like she said, we are recording it, and you're all welcome to it. I'll try to send it out to everyone on the list. Um, Anise, before you go to the next section, I want to just read a couple of these uh, comments. I'm so overwhelmed with this wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for being our eyes and nourishing our souls in a wonderful <laughs> way. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Well, I enjoyed doing it, and I'll talk about that in the end. But let me, because I, I have a lot of things I want to show you, and even if you just get to glance at them, and I see my own son on this, he knows I have way more to say about every one of these, and I could go into a lot of issues of politics and cultural anthropology and aesthetics, and when art is making itself in terms of, quote, high and low culture change. So think about this as another moment, because when I put the book you saw together, it was definitely not uh, accepted in the official cultural institution as very accomplished, important art. And then the walls have come tumbling down. So we're in an age where a lot of walls have come tumbling down, including the fact that these artists were once working in a generally ephemeral medium, but now, I mean, obviously many murals were meant to last, but a lot of them didn't last at all. But now the minute you paint something, it has some global instant life and it changes both your intention and your impact. So bear in mind that that was happening and it affects both what people have to say and the power of what they have to say. So I'm gonna go into this next section with that as a prelude. Before you do that, I think Karen Johnson has a question. She has her hand raised. All right, yeah. Um, Karen, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, I'm loving the presentation and just wondering what's going to happen to these lovely creations when the plywood comes down. Well, I, I, I personally do not know, but I suspect that it will be a combination of um, they're already being stolen because that's, you know, like an instant issue. Banksy has made that almost political problem on who owns something and whose work is this anyway when you, it's a free for all and you've put it out for pub, in public consumption, not behind the safety of gallery ropes or any of that. Uh, but I also think that it's a possibility that they may be auctioned off and things like that as ways of, as fundraisers, but oh, there's no formal um, program to save them. Yeah. I, we have other things to save that you'll see lots of examples of when we go forward. I don't mean art, I mean life. Um, okay, so what am I to press if we're going to go on? The share screen? 
What do I? Yes, do I share a screen at okay. the bottom. Yeah, share. No, no, that's not right. No, what? How come I see nothing? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. All right. Do you uh, have? Yeah, go back to Chrome. Okay, <laughs> went away. Um, there you go. Let me just make sure I get. There we go. Perfect. All right. Well, provocative. Is every kind of artist provocateur, you know, cultural intervention with every attitude that you can imagine, every platitude twisted inside out. You'll see this as an example of, you know, the multi-layered collage in public life. It draws, you know, many officially delegated artists like Robert Rauschenberg played dramatically with collage and intention. We certainly had Andy Warhol playing with Campbell's Soup and here's another version of it. You'll see many of these also, many of the things that you're gonna see and I saw were just a repetition like mold and mushroom growing all over where you happen to see it, that incidental peripatetic relationship to art, the opposite of the formality of a curated show when you go to a cultural institution. So that relationship you have in terms of discovery changes your experience. And this is an example of one we're gonna just take a moment on because it's the beginning of the political analysis of the moment and the first thing everyone noticed not only was the air cleaner, but nobody was buying gas the way they used to. And we had many parallel uh, consequences, you know, suggestions of nationalizing oil so we could get rid of it and convert it to green, et cetera. So these kind of messages, and these are different artists all working on top of each other. So it's like their own conversation. The, image on the top, which, you know, draws from the kind of surrealism you'd find in Remedios Barros or someone like that, where you can have doors inside of your anatomy is a metaphor for uh, internal uh, mystery and all the other ways. And as we're sheltered in, in this old anatomy illustration, it seems like we're kind of down to our essentials the land being too valuable for people to park on it message from German Justin Herman, Robert Moses, a whole bunch of other players in public policy who paved over, you know, the Joni Mission Mitchell parking lot, a lot of our natural beauty in green. This is a calm soup as opposed to a clam soup. And then on the right we have uh very popular guy around town, the bullshitter. I must have seen 50 of these as I was driving around. So, whoops, excuse me, I just went too fast. Let me go. Whoa, 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 here, there. That's the next one. Uh, again, uh, probably the mice um, uh, or rats. I've been told they were mice or rats. They're scurrying around town. They're kind of humorous, but they're very instructive and they make suggestions like this, invest in clean tech. And then we have, I am just gonna call her the naked fairy red cross, a little slightly odd, mysterious offering. I suspect this would not have been a commission piece, but a sort of volunteer um, inspiration. Another Max Airman, this one more from a, a kind of outer space mystery, what's in front of us, um, aesthetic, far more intimidating than his fish. And when you see this wrapped around a building, even though it's meant to guard the glass, it also sets a sort of eerie nightclub feeling on the street. Uh, a common emotion of the moment. This is one that I spent a long time 
looking at and trying to understand. I, at first, the Spanish version of a, lie, uh, a leer se ha dicho. So I had to look it up a couple of different ways. Even though I have a command of Spanish, I knew that it was uh, an idiom that was being played on in the meme of stay calm messages like we've seen in the others. And I am looking for the exact thing that I found. Here we go. Um, that the expression is se ha dicho, is an expression used when waiting time for your money is over. And now is the time you can charge. It's also used for revenge in case you were deceived many times. Now you have an opportunity for revenge. I, um, I think that speaks to different um, attitudes of the moment. It is adjacent, and I, you have a blow up of this erotic poem on the right, um, which I'm not really uh, sure how it directly fits to the pandemic other than, whoops, excuse me, someone's spam call. Um, and you can see that it is created by cutting letters out, uh, words out, magazine style, which was a very popular sort of art conceit several decades ago, drawn directly from the idea of ransom notes, you know, so that your handwriting couldn't be traced. Um, it's actually a, a sort of funny little erotica poem that you would not expect to see out in public with such detail and intention. Another example of This Is Weird Without You, done by the same artist, is the Leer, Se I Que Dicho, um, and also did Perfect Date. And if you look at the imagery on the right next to Perfect Date, it's just straight out porn advertising. Um, take it as part of the layered texture conversation of the city under lockdown. Another example of grabbing from other plagues, the imagery, the warnings, the creepiness done in interesting mockery. And on top of it, I'm going to call them a group of owl gangsters. I, they probably have a reference that I'm not decoding, uh, but they are kind of confident. More examples of repeated, we see the same paste-ups tagged over in repetition all over town. This campaign is part of the free people freedom, uh, which is a partially commercial music rebellion effort. Uh, they have enigmatic to me, though funky and fascinating uh, imagery like this in several spots around town, just put up on plywood in the same protect me and let me tell you what I think kind of way. I think most of you will recognize both the scowl and the red face appropriate to a warning Again, the warnings from an earlier time, but remains persistent. And there's a whole series of his colleagues in various contagions. I was glad that uh, Mitch was seen coughing. I, I, I don't know why, I just thought it was the right. Uh, already warning pox. And most amused at the placid face Jared Kushner with mom since he's part of an orthodox community that questions vaccines and creates measles outbreaks. Um, you will see the persistent theme 
of the people who couldn't afford to be sheltered. Uh, in many ways, this message is, it's a privilege. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment to say that this is our opportunity to solve one of our most solvable problems. And if you have any impulse to contribute to the conversation, the buck has stopped literally at London Breed's door. The hotels are empty. The money has been given by three of our deep pocketed citizens, the billionaire class, to shelter them. And the obstacle is that she claims that there are not um, sufficient support services. The uh, Glide Memorial and Goodwill and others have already created a structure. This is an emergency that we could come out of the pandemic having solved those hotel rooms will not be filled by tourists and conventioners for a long time. And this has gone, this shame has gone on too long. Enough of my appeal for everyone to help heal this problem as we can. So there we go. Today I will unmask my heart. Um, but of course, that's not a message that's left alone. People have to then comment on it in kind of a, a chain uh, letter way in which our affections and emotions clash around town. Expressing itself in this slightly seasick looking putty, disgusted, and as you can see, being blessed means money. We move into an equally potent area of expression that keeps us all amused and is part of our cultural um, legacy of using humor, using cartoons, even whether it's Daumier, Saul Steinberg, or the guy who does these mice all over town on skateboards, showing us the good life, reminding us of what's to be in play, including wiping our bottoms as we go along. Also everywhere are these figures. They are homies. They're done by John uh, Meister um, and they're Jan Meister is his name with a Y. They're called Big Eyed Homies. They're a very good example of creating your own industry, just like Walt Disney invented Mickey Mouse. He creates these, but he gives them away all over town and he amuses you with them. They're your bus driver. They're, you know, your best bud. They're, you know, your playmate. Again, the toilet paper becoming um, one of the silliest aspects of the hoarding uh, during the pandemic right next to these little guys and up in the hate. So they were all over every neighborhood that I went in. This is a fish on a very posh um, sushi restaurant um, in the Mission. And this is a guy with a low rent margarita for 99 cents. Uh, Hope he opens up soon. And obviously you can get your beer uh, down in the Portola. There weren't a lot there, but this particular bar made sure and kept you in the clover and welcomed you in, as did this Dog Patch Wine Club. Uh, all over town, we've got Unity Soup, we've got little people winking at you, ways in which little ironic jokes or founding corners, part of the discovery, acting like a tourist in your own town. And the squirrels, also kind of like girl, friend, no, it's squirrel friend, gone wild. And of course, they're masked and cheerful and proliferating. This is a project that began with a group of people in the sunset and they are, as you can see, trying to make the COVID friendly, I think, um, popping around on this bench, but um, they offer, if anyone is interested, free public benches in your neighborhood. Check them out. Uh, Castro, 
both wit and irony, as you see, they're both happy and sad faces in this vase, but trying to be cheerful. Believe it or not, this is the ticket booth at the Castro Theater under a rainbow umbrella sheltering you from the rain of COVID spray bug all over town, cheerful, silly, ironic ways in which mostly sticker and paste and spray has cross-eyed ice cream cones sticking its tongue out at you. I show you this picture, which is not taken in, uh, it was taken in the last three weeks, but it was created before it's adjacent to the public health because it's an example of French, F-R-N-N-C-H. You've seen these honey bears. They're also like an act of public generosity next to the health department on Mission Street where there was a line of people waiting to be tested around the block. But he has been one of the most active in having the example of wear your mask. These are everywhere. I, I, I must have seen a hundred of them and they're different. Other people love them too. As you can see, it was stolen on the same day it was made. And this was posted on, I guess it's one of the, one of the media, complaining that it was stolen almost as quickly as it was made. And as you can see, it's a very cute version. It wasn't like he just did one and he made many variations on this theme. And a very kind of play on Banksy's aesthetic of using the black and white of this little raccoon already masked, ready, ready to roll up to the bar. And I am guessing that this is trying to say that our money is sick. Or maybe we have to protect it. You could probably interpret it either way. Lots of these dunces, very charming, kind of quizzical, ordinary, ordinary confusion. Many pigeons, and on the left you will see, you know, a play on the traditional junky plastic thank you bag. But we'll be back. We'll be right back, which I thought in the beginning was a message that people were giving out, and then they started to fade. An example of a very formal piece of what would be odd art making of arbitrary, like throw out, uh, you know, your reject uh, photos made into these little miniature galleries uh, all over. And as you can see, they interact with the, the playful way in which the super graph is on top of them. This is another interactive street puzzle, a, 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 a fantasy land to enjoy on Valencia Street, a very piece of cool contemporary modernism on the side of flower and water, nice restaurant and um, the mission. One of my favorites, I will admit, yoga studio in Hayes Valley, which is that we're all ready to play, even with our masks and gloves on. So I think that we are at the end of this section. So let's, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what we're going to go into. I'm leaving that word mood swing, but let's go back for our little response to what you just got to see. Would you like to pause I, the screen share so that we can see everyone more clearly? How's Perfect. that? Great. Um, once again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand feature, um, or you can type it in the chat, or if, if you're having trouble, you can raise your hand on the screen and I will look for you. Um, Kathy O'Brien has a question. So, 
so are you noticing concentrations in certain parts of town more than other parts of town? I mean, it seems like you've referenced a lot in the mission and the hate. I'm just wondering if there are concentrations. Yes, absolutely. Um, but it didn't mean that any part of town had none. The concentration is very parallel to the places where there already is a concentration of art making activities uh, in the mission, in Hayes Valley, in the hate, um, some up in the ca lots in the Castro. Um, the majority, you don't really see them again until you get to the beach. I did drive up and down the avenue. Oh, Ninth Avenue has a fair number. I, I could point out where each of them are, you know, at some point, but the, um, the concentration were in those areas, but then there would be surprises where you didn't expect to see them. There were almost none, which may speak for itself, in Russian Hill and Knob Hill. I drove around that area and almost none in Fisherman's Wharf, even though things were boarded up. So just to, just to respond to like how it played out. Great, um, I'll read a question from the chat. Uh, Rosemary Cameron asks, I know that, I think it's Finch, the person who does the honey bears, yeah. has been selling his work and donating pretty significantly, or pretty significant sums to several nonprofit profits. He says the honey bears are popular because they are positive, nostalgic, and inclusive. Any comments on Finch and his honey bears and its popularity? Well, I, I, I agree. It, it has that message of, you know, why do we like those little commercial icons? Uh, they're cute. They, we can't go, uh, can't, we can't deny that we, they represent that. And um, he is extremely popular. He has flamingos and other things he's done. Um, but he's, he's been very active. So they're everywhere for people to notice. Great, thank you. Um, anybody else, any questions, comments? Okay. Well, that means we can just resume. Yeah, let's keep going. Uh, so um, you already know that we have a mood swing. Yes, just click, there you go. And then Chrome again. There, not there, huh? If you oh. click on the Chrome icon. There we up. go, there we go. Can you see? I can see, okay. Yes. Well, I don't think I have to explain that this happened until everything we saw was created before this moment. I was driving from Sonoma. Oh, actually, let me tell you what this is. Again, this is a cheat. This is actually on the High Line in New York City uh, because it is what happened. It changed everything in terms of what time meant, in terms of time to organize, both personally and politically. Um, and that is what I was greeted with as I was driving back from Sonoma, which is Tracy Piper's response. She did this the very next day. It's on Divisadero. Uh, you can see the same, if you recall, Rosie the Riveter at the very beginning. Um, this is the same artist, she uses the same, um, you know, very stylized way in which color articulates uh, mood. The eyes in her paintings are very luminous and you feel the bruise by, you know, using an indigo on the lip and as a shadow under the chin. But yet, you know, the, the pink tenderizes her. Um, there's a lot of reverence, respect and looking forward with uncertainty in this portrait. It's a friend of hers from Oakland. I spoke to her about it afterwards. And this was up all over the message, very raw, direct, doesn't need to be stylized. It's crudity makes it more powerful. We were at a moment of democracy needing to 
reevaluate itself. This was painted in Clarion Alley the very next day. Uh, as you can see already, there's a fuck cops little st uh, stencil at the top. That particular stencil was everywhere. I, I saw it in many colors. I knew it was the same one because it had the same pattern. Um, this was painted by Cerrone the same day. Cerrone is a cartoonist also working a lot with bears. He's famous for his sneakers. They change color. As you notice, this is a blue bear. Blue has become a kind of problematic color to parse because it also represents the police and it represents having the blue, uh, the blues as we know. And he has painted this spot, which is right around the corner from Community of Thrift on, across from the police station on Valencia, many times with different figures for this is what he did. Uh, I think he did this by Monday or Tuesday. Next to what you see is a black and white image of the names of the people who have been killed through police violence uh, and obviously not complete. This is very much bringing the issue home and the Mario Woods killed in San Francisco, a long standing uh, point of uh, contention and aggravation uh, for social justice issues in the city and brought everyone out of confinement in droves and new messages. Hope was already there on uh, this. Then they added Black Lives Matter. The world was already there. They added Black Lives Matter. This already had Miss Seeing Your Face. That's the same artist who's done these other public messaging. But now each of the faces, a different artist added, the same one who's been doing the paper cutouts that you see on the right and naming the people who have been killed and named and say their name has obviously been a command uh, paying attention and, and keeping their um, memory alive and the meaning of their deaths alive. And on the right, this is a, a Latino restaurant uh, on Valencia using a Mexican um, traditional like taqueria calendar art of a revolutionary on a horse, but bringing it into the moment um, alongside the same need to revolt against the powerful structures. And everyone responding both in respect and fear in a very uh, hard, to weigh out which was stronger combination. This is a store that has beautiful uh, handmade goods owned by a Japanese woman and calling herself a grandma, immediately hearkening to Japanese owned stores being in peril during the roundup for the internment camps. And as you can see, she has beautifully, on the left, managed to make a little piece of art out of her uh, covering her windows for protection. Even on the lower left, that is a, a little oil painting, a beautiful little oil painting that's part of it. Um, another very original protest that I saw many versions of all over town, but then got specialized are making these kind of fun reference to old fashioned touristy bullhorns all out of bicycle parts. This one is obviously tailored to the uprising of the moment. And this is a skinhead, mean, big guy. And if it's a specific person, I haven't figured it out, but obviously his expression um, speaks for some 
ugly viciousness. I think that's Trump. And Trump, Mom. That's, how could that be Trump? He has no hair. Yeah, without hair. Skinhead Trump. Trump is a skinhead. Oh, it's Trump as a skinhead. Thank you. My own son has to tell me that. Huh? Um, all right. Well, it was up for not more than an hour when I came back. And that's what happened to it in an hour. So it was a target. So symbolic action and sacred space and using literally paint to represent violence is all happening at once. It's interesting that I didn't write. Is this Trump also? You can, you can Boris tell Johnson, me. right? Or Trump, I don't know. Uh, I, I thought it was Boris Johnson, but why does he have a piano key tie? We'll figure that out. And a lot of the language and the sentiment comes right from Occupy Wall Street. And we have many of the symbols of solidarity and resistance coalescing. And this was painted on Sunday. Excuse me, my phone is ringing. Uh, and on Sunday, in the hate, in the exact spot that for many years, Jerry Garcia has reigned. Um, sorry. And um, as you can see, not only is it a very vivid accomplished, but there's something about all of the kind of COVID confusion and collision of gesture behind it that feels very appropriate to the moment. Uh, this happened this morning on Bernal Hill when Susan Hoffman called me and said, you must come up. Today's paper chronicles the story. This is a rock that uh, the tradition of painting began about 15 years ago. It first began as a political gesture, then it's been everything from a piece of Halloween corn candy to a pizza, but it has been painted in the last week over and over six or seven times and is now obviously become another icon of resistance of the moment. You can want, hear about it tonight. This is the KGO news story. And it's part of your news story too because Susan Hoffman called me and we were there to witness it together. I wanted to end with these last two. This one at a uh, piercing parlor. Um, that has three images that I think sum up the healing, the rage, and the get back to work under very new circumstances that we haven't sorted out. And the name Cold Steel America seemed quite appropriate, but I also didn't want to leave you in a um, moment of negativity when I would like to invite every one of you to see me at the champagne bar when we can toast the best of our lives. So thank you for listening. And let's, I, I know we only have about 10 minutes left, but I really would love to hear what you've been thinking and seeing partially in response to this art and partially in response to everything we're experiencing, both as individuals and as a um, global community. Thank you. Well, I've, I've been in the house for so long. I'm happy to see stuff that's outside the house. I was hoping that people would feel that way. And, and to see that this kind of San Francisco spirit is still strong, even while we're inside. Who is saying this? I'm not, I can't. Oh, uh, this is Carrie. Oh, hi. Sorry, my camera was off because I was stretching a few minutes ago. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yes, well, I, 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 I was hoping that seeing a body of work like this, not just like what's in your particular neighborhood, or what, you know, there is a kind of drive-by on the edge of your perception that street art 
uh, deals with that is different than the formal experience of, oh, I'm going to the museum and I'm going to contemplate it. It is definitely in competition with the, you know, advertising and public messaging and what's on your mind. So the fact that it literally is at the edge of your perception and then it grabs your attention is part of its strategy. And then when you don't know what's going on and everything was quiet out there, you kind of think of this as like the the little gremlins in the night and look what appeared. It's, I like to think of this kind of art as an act of deep generosity. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, some of it is an act of anger now, but that's a form of being generous with your effort instead of just like smashing windows, so. Um, <clears throat> this is Susan. And um, I just wanted to let you know on the Bernal Rock thing, they uh, the DPW painted over it, and they got so much. So many residents were upset about it that they've already come out with a an apology for covering it over. They said it was a mistake. They never cover murals, and they've even already donated paint and funds to the woman who has already repainted it. So that's positive. You mean it was repainted since this morning? been already repainted she put out a call to people and said hey if you're ready you know we're going to repaint it so they've already repainted it and Since this morning it got re it, they painted over i was there the painting the image you just saw is from 11 and 30 this morning yeah apparently it's already been i haven't seen it but there's all these there's a lot of information out on instagram and <laughs> the letter that here, i thought it. i was bringing you a here and now it's it's already oh, well i was surprised well no, no this is susan carp my neighbor who is, she she is giving you the latest in the great yeah, that's right late breaking news on the bernal rock <laughs> you know, so I was happy to see a lot of people called the mayor. I called to say, you know, this is not really a good use of your funds. You shouldn't be doing this. And um, and then someone from DPW came out with an apology and did the right thing, so. By the way, Susan is not a apricot poodle. <laughs> I, I wish I was. I mean, she's very cute, but the poodle is cute and Susan's cute. But She's not cool. I'd, I'd love to know what other people have seen, what you thought of the things that you did get to see in the show, it, what the politics of the moment are demanding and how they reflect in what you've seen. This is not an answer to that question, but somebody did ask, um, Renee asked, among these, this group, any sense of how many might be doing murals versus, or might be new to doing murals versus those who have already done murals in SF? I think there are a lot of new people coming out there. Uh, I, I think they're just, you know, it's one of the beautiful art belongs to everyone. Um, a art, everyone is an artist. I hope my mother is on this. My mother is 95 and still making art. So, you know, is a lifelong opportunity. Uh, and um, the way in which it is an expressive tool that often people feel inhibited about. And there have been a lot of breakthroughs during this pause where people were forced to pick up new habits and hobbies. And it's kind of, you know, foolproof. No one sees you doing it. You can try it. So I would say the more accomplished pieces were definitely by people who already have a, an art practice, but you saw some rude and crude, just put it up there things in what I showed you. Great, thank you. And then someone just asked, um, can you say what the Bernal Heights rock is for those that don't know? Oh yeah, well, I, I live in Bernal Heights, a neighborhood near the mission in San Francisco. And the, it's a beautiful hill, uh, famous for walking and all kinds of other lovely things. There's just a big old rock that's been sitting there that you normally wouldn't pay attention. But people start, you know, the way in which it's become contested space is that someone just started painting it. So what artists do is make things visible. You know, what JR did this, this summer in San Francisco and did in the subways is he took ordinary people and he blew up 
their faces as photo blow-ups. He did it in the favelas of, of uh, Rio. Uh, wonderful artist named Chip Thomas does it. I was going to show you some of their images, but I, I was already jammed. Uh, but the whole mechanism of making the invisible visible, uh, injustices visible, the forgotten, you know, all of, all of that. Um, that was part of Diego Rivera's strategy is to honor um, the people who are not honored. All of this challenge about who's an essential worker, uh, which is why we saw so many uh, offerings acknowledging their contribution at this time, which we hope becomes part of the conversations that change the way they participate and they're respected and all of the rest in the upheaval we're all experiencing. So we can take these messages, internalize them, and act on them as citizens. This whole talk is about artists as citizens. Um, not waiting to be commissioned or have, you know, the acknowledgement that, oh, you're a capital A artist because you're in a gallery that makes you a real artist. I happen to have, as you can tell by my tone, a prejudice about that divide. And most people repress their natural ability to do anything because you have to be like good at it. No, everyone's good at a lot of things. So this happens also in public art. Uh, there's gesture, there's, you know, great surprise. It's all part of not waiting to be officially sanctioned. I can make a comment in the last minute that may, um, some of you may or may not be aware of about the relationship of cultural institutions to the upheaval of the moment. And um, SFMOMA, unfortunately, is in the um, eyes of um, a lot of accusation at the moment, the way the Whitney was last year when they were forced to both pay attention to the actual investment of their board members and to the actual content of what they were representing inside it, terms of the range of artists, etc. So when everything started switching from being COVID to being George Floyd, the museum, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art did the same thing that almost every cultural organization felt obligated to do. How they handled that, what was done for optics, what was done for reflecting who they are is, you know, very individual. But what the museum did was put on its website a quote from Glenn Lignan, a very wonderful black artist. He did America backwards in neon. Uh, you can look up his work. And he's kind of a James Baldwin in the sense that he's so strong and clear that you can't um, do anything respect his both lyric imagination and his gutsy. He's very, he's also very identified with queer politics, et cetera. So he's a very um, excellent person. The museum immediately got all kinds of flack for using a black artist's word to protect themselves. So we're now in, a very complicated, the museum issued, the director of the museum issued a long apology and a long letter committing to, you know, reviewing the balance of the collection. It's the same kind of thing that happens like when the guerrilla girls attack an institution and say you don't have enough women that are represented, but they never got the response that people are getting now. They only got tokenism. So something is in the air. I'm not even defending the fact that they got attacked for using it because I actually think there's nothing wrong because he does represent an incredibly powerful artist with words that move people at the moment. However, who has a right to say anything for someone else is up for grabs within institutions. In public art that's not commissioned, in street art, which is a very like, you know, like hip hop in terms of its authenticity, you have your own permission. No one has to decide, you know, whether your country of origin or your gender or your weight or your choices in life, your taste are 
empowering you to say something, you just say it. And that's actually the spirit I would like for all of our responses right now in terms of artists as citizens with our capacity, our communication skills and our just, we're still alive to what matters to carry that forward. And that's what I think inspired me to go out and see what people were saying. And obviously I've only gotten a fraction of it. So nothing I've presented today is meant to be comprehensive, but more of a stimulus for the range of art making that's out there that's supposed to keep us buoyant to our values. So I know it's five o'clock. Is there anything else that I can help people with? I saw Kathy O'Brien had a question. I'm not sure if she still does, but I just want to check in. Sure, Kathy O'Brien. Yes, I, I, had, I just wanted to make a quick comment that I really appreciate the focus on the um, collage art, the quick art, the tagging, the, the altering of the art in terms of the shift in emotions. Because I think historically I've had a tendency to look more at the mural art and not as attentive to that as like true art as well. And I've really appreciated your kind of emphasizing that and bringing that forward. Well, I love the fact that you understood that they come from parallel um, impetus and that they serve in terms of visual texture and cueing as much information as the more formal murals. And the word alter itself in all its layers, to alter something is to repair it as well as to make it sacred. And when I was talking about the black rock, it's another example of something that people assigned a value to and has now become contested public space, just the way the uh, lobby of the Washington mural uh, a high school mural has become contested public space, obviously painted by a Diego Rivera protege, obviously trying to recapitulate history in ways at the time, extremely radical, progressive and, and, and embracing now under all kinds of questions. So um, I think that noticing that even someone who, you know, makes a silk screen on their kitchen table, just the way you make a poster to go to a rally and decides to stick it around their neighborhood as a communication, they're changing their world. And that's our opportunity. Anise, thank you so much. People have loved this. And I wanted to point out that Anise in 2009 published this book, Street Arts. Which I showed in the first slide, which I can, I can yeah. Mission Muralismo, so in case uh, you can probably find that in your bookstore. She's it's very easy to find. Just go on. Will and, there and, be another and one? I do you have a website if you want to look at the um, a lot of other images that are related to some of these topics. Um, you're, it's just anisjacobi.com, my name. <laughs>